What's up, bud? Oops, can you hear me? I can hear you. How you doing? How's everything been? Uh, doing, doing well, David. How about yourself, man? Doing okay, running around <laughs> mentally. Right. For a couple of people to join in. Okay. Yeah, uh, my man CJ should be here in a minute. TJ, what's going on? Hey guys, how's everyone doing? Doing good. Awesome. Matt coming in too. Good, good. For a couple more people. What's up, Matt? I see there's a Christian, Victoria, and Lucas. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Long time listener, first time caller. Awesome. Um, if you guys just don't mind putting on mute, and if you guys have the ability to turn on the video, I appreciate it. If you don't, I totally understand. Last time I asked him to do that, she was running on the treadmill listening to me talk. And I was like, you can shut it off now. She's like dripping and sweating and running through. And I was like, this is pretty, this is pretty impressive that you're that dedicated. And then next time she jumped on, she was at like Costco pushing a car and I'm like, wow, that is dedication. Like that makes me super happy. Awesome stuff. So we'll go from there. Hello, Alexis. Yeah, so as I mentioned before, if you guys can just put it on mute, and then if you if you have the ability to turn on your video, you can. If you can't, no big deal. I was like looking at people's faces so I can kind of read the audience and kind of go from there. Christian, are you with Matt? Yes, I am. Cool. I like your uh, your beard. I'm very jealous. <laughs> this is 40 years of no shaving. Thank you. This is it. That's the man can get. I do save a lot of money, a dollar, a dollar, uh, a dollar uh, whatever the heck it's called, shave club. Because I like, do like two of them. I'm like, I'm done. We're ready to go. Shoot. All right, awesome. Well, if anyone else joins in, we can start. Right. So <clears throat> thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. I kind of want to tell the, 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 you know, what we're doing for the mentorship sessions. Um, a lot of you have reached out. Some of your friends are friends. Uh, a lot of you guys I know. Um, I don't do this very often. I have three sessions, everyone else pays for the sessions. I'm not obviously charging anybody here, there's just people I feel that, you know, uh, you know, that asked, reached out. There is a, a qualification, it goes like this. If you have Facebook, I ask you to go into David Chen Panda uh, Facebook. And what that does is it gives you previous lessons that if you miss, if you're too busy, uh, you know, you gotta go on a date, whatever is going on in the world nowadays, you can definitely check it up, catch up there, you can share ideas. The other important part is you can synergize with people and that synergy will create the energy that you need to really just kind of, you know, continue to, to really grow your brand to work with other people and go from there. The great thing about what we're trying to do is hold people accountable and the accountability is the most important part because, you know, it, it, I like to call this Team Panda and going from there. And then you have to believe in, in the method by madness. I'll tell you about my background and a more clear view and, and kind of where we're at. And, you know, we only invite new people uh, once a month. Uh, everyone else basically does, does pay. So, you know, congratulations if you got invited and going from there. Definitely not charging you. There's none of this, none of this stuff. It's just good, pure, we care and going from there. So, uh, and I'll go through the first, you know, maybe 40, 50 minutes about my story and things that I would like for you guys to learn and apply. And then we do hold accountability from that. I figure if I can give out my time for free, you could show up and be at the sessions, right? That's a, that's a fair trade-off. Uh, and of course, if there's someone that you're like, hey dude, I really think that they'd be great, we should definitely add them on. I would love, you know, just give me a message or shoot us at the Panama podcast, we're honest taking care of it, and we'll go from there. And of course, the last part is make sure you sign up to Davidson Panda. Uh, that is going to register you, and that for, that for any of our events that we have, whether I'm, you know, throwing an ESPYs party, or, you know, an Oscars party, or any openings, all the people that work with me are always invited to go to these things and mingle with celebrities and guests. And, you know, as long as you don't embarrass me, you'll always be invited and kind of going from there, but it, it does give you access to those types of things. So 
let me go ahead and begin. So I'll just check one more thing before I do anything. Uh, Two seconds. So, you know, the first thing I kind of want to tell you is just my story. I think that's important for everyone to understand. And as some of you don't know me, so it would be a beneficial thing that some of you might assume you know me, but it might not be the story. Oh, Alexis. There's two Alexis. Wow. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, my background obviously is, you know, I'll, I'll tell you about my current, what I'm currently doing, and then how I kind of got here. So, it's kind of, and if you could put on mute, that would be great too. Alexis, I appreciate that. Um, for those of you that follow me on social media, it's, it's David Chen Panda. I figure someone told you about me or you followed me or I was lucky enough to get interviewed by these amazing group of people. I kind of told my story, but you know, I'm 40 years old. I just turned 42 months ago. I was supposed to go to some tropical island in Costa Rica and uh, all my great friends are there. It's a big number and it just didn't happen because of COVID, right? And right now it's a very, very hard time to deal with COVID and the way life is. And, you know, when you look at my social media and you look at the branding, the one thing I want to tell everybody here, it's a highlight reel. That's all it is, right? There's so much work and so many tears and so much energy and so much stress that nobody happens to see outside of what you do in social media. And that is one thing I want to understand is, Stop comparing yourself to everybody else. You have no idea what their stories are, right? And we, as a society, we get bought into looking at everyone else's story and industry and feeling that we are not achieving our goals or we're not doing the best things. Uh, and we, well, because we're doing that, that really causes a psychological issue and a damage, and it really hurts us and our feelings. The whole purpose of this is to be honest and truthful and tell you guys, um, John, if you can put on me, that's great. Uh, and how I did it and where I'm at, and to let you understand, it doesn't matter where you are, or, or, or you know, your your background, your ethnicity, your 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 sex. It just comes down to you as an individual and your ability to succeed. <clears throat> so, first things first is, I was the youngest managing partner at Deloitte. I ran a thirty million dollar division at. I did it in seven years, and Deloitte is the world's largest accounting finance firm. What's amazing about that is we did $46 billion, and we worked with 80% of the world's largest companies. And we did things like accounting, audit, tax, joint ventures, mergers, how to grow company, business plans, consulting. And if you put in David Chen, Deloitte, Mexico, uh, the number one accounting finance firm in the world, you'll see me on like 400 articles with the president of China, the president of Mexico, being a keynote speaker. It, 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 I've done a great amount of things in my corporate career that was very, very blessed. We had 82% of the marketplace. That means between all the other guys, we took 82%. And when I started it, we had 0% of the marketplace. So from zero to 30 million, zero to 82% to being the most viewed website in our country to become a global leader at 33 is insane. Here's the most insane part. I'm a college dropout. I did not graduate college at all. Okay. So I became a partner at a county finance firm. And the day I show up to the partnership, they're like, we're going to make you partner. This is great. Do you have a copy of your degree? And I go, what degree? And it shocked them. It shook them. It, it made them very upset because I fell through the cracks when I shouldn't have. And the story on that, I'll get to in, in a second. From there, I started my first private equity firm called BLCP Capital. In that firm, we focused on three spaces. One space was we did the real estate side where you bought and sold 380 properties, sold for millions of dollars. It was called a REIT, where you do government uh, money and really sell it to government for pension funds. Number two, I was in the cannabis space. I bought a license, ran it, it's called and always for branding, it's called Green Panda Dispensary. You can look it up, Green Panda Dispensary AZ. Bought it for 3.2, flipped it for 6.7 in its first year. Ran, operated, you know, never got high on my own supply, smart base, but definitely understood the industry. And then we were representing a Chinese group, the Warren Buffett of China, to buy the Memphis Grizzlies 
for $60 million, 14% of the company. And then Steve Ballmer came in and bought the Clippers for a billion dollars and screwed up my valuation, but I would have been, I would have been one of the owners of the Memphis Grizzlies. I'll continue to move forward. Then I got into crypto and blockchain. I was a vice president and business developer of a company called, called SparkleCoin. If you saw my social media two days ago, uh, Snoop Dogg was part of it, Ray J. I raised $150 million, launched that tech, tech crunch. And before we did it, September 23rd, and by October 8th, the Chinese government said crypto and blockchain were illegal. So we lost $120 million because the government, and I was taking 10% of the profits. So that's $12 million out of my pocket just because the government changed. We bid it on the Prince of Dubai's smart city. We we're gonna to try to make the city a smart city with crypt with blockchain. We came in second, we partnered with Deloitte, a company called Altamini. We lost to Ethereum. If you don't know anything, you know anything about crypto, at least you know Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, but not bad for a small company. And after that was all said and done, I then started GTIF Capital. And you know, I'm in El Paso, Texas. I was born in Taiwan. I grew up here. Very, very proud of my city. And I now sit on eight boards. If you're in the esports space, you know I'm a partner in FaZe, you know I'm an advisory board. The first deal I did for FaZe Plan was a Super Bowl commercial that involved Alex Rodriguez and Charlie Sheen. And we had more engagements, and Gary Vee is the one who actually hooked it up. Then, then A Rod and Charlie Sheen did combined. What's interesting about that story is I put the Super Bowl commercial together with, with the team in a week and a half, and that was the first time anybody in esports was in the Super Bowl. If you're a big Gary V fan, if you ever saw him wear a red face hoodie, that was me giving him the hoodie um, and, and kind of going from there. And then, of course, I sit on eight different boards, I sit on a $4 billion uh, mining company, and I mean literally mining in Mongolia, down to uh, a commercial real estate company called Comloan, where our partners are the CFO of PetSmart and the XCO of Starwoods, which is the Marriott guys, uh, down to obviously the esports side of things. And I really believe in growing and development. And I can sit there and tell you confidently that I'm a multimillionaire. I can sit there and tell you that I own every nice car you could possibly imagine. And I have multiple homes and you know, I have a Rolls Royce, I have a Bentley, I, I have a Porsche, I have a GTR. I've got two Lamborghinis, and I currently have nine cars. What's the point of that story? It isn't to bang my chest how great it is. The point of the story is I was miserable. That's the point of the story. I was miserable most of my life. And the ones that grew up in El Paso know that I own the majority of the clubs and bars and restaurants here. And so I knew Avicii before Avicii was big and Tiesto. And you know, when I was in that space, I had a country bar, I had a sushi lounge, I had a, I had a hip hop bar, I had a house place, and I'm Chinese, which even makes it even more funnier. In El Paso, which is 85% Hispanic. But let me tell you about my, about, about my background and how I got here. <clears throat> first off, I came to the country homeless. That's the first thing. When I came to this great country, I don't care about your politics. I don't talk politics, I don't talk religion, I don't talk, I don't talk sports. So except it's esports, let's talk about. We all have our own views. But when I came to this country, we were so poor that my family would draw, we would walk around the ghetto homes in Colorado and we would pick out the, the beds, literal beds that had bed bugs, and we would use it as mattresses. I would have to dig through garbage cans for food and toys and clothes. And I'll tell you something, guys. As a very young person, who does not understand what the word poor is, you know what the, the meaning of feeling financially poor is. And it's an awful feeling. By third grade, my parents couldn't help me out with homework anymore because they didn't have a college education. English was the fourth or fifth language. My parents came here as dishwashers and, and literally made their way up. There were times when my parents would have to hide me in the restaurant because they could not afford childcare. So I would sit, my mom would be a coat chain, a coat exchange grill. And I would be sitting there very quietly hidden in the back corner underneath jackets so they wouldn't get caught because they couldn't afford anyone else. I sat there for 10 hours just quietly not doing anything and playing with one toy my whole entire life. It, 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 it scars you, it emotionally drains you. It makes you feel less than, less superior. 
not as equal. And when it came down to lunches and dinners, on a good day, because we couldn't get on welfare, I would get an egg sandwich. And if you've ever put an egg sandwich in a lunchbox for 10 hours, it's the most awful smell. There was no exchanging of food. There was no cookies. There was no school supplied meals. Remember, I'm 40. It's very, very different from my age than it was back in your guys' current stuff. And I remember that, that feeling of feeling just very unworthy of being around people. And when I was 12, the hardest thing that happened to me was my parents had me write the menus for the restaurants that they were renting out. And I had to put it in Spanish and in English. I'm 12 years old. And if I wrote that menu wrong, I was not only going to yell that, it was going to affect our financial income and food. My upbringing was, was a great one in a sense where I was very close to my mother. But my father and I, up until now, we didn't have a relationship. My father's an ex-Marine. My father came to this country. My father's a type A. My father had a really bad temper. And it made me really resent my father. And as a Asian American growing up here and you watch TV and you see these amazing dads, you feel like there's something wrong with what's going on, but you can't even explain it because it's not in the same culture. You know, <clears throat> as I move forward, I talk about these things. I want everyone to understand. I had to overcome English as my fourth language. I had to overcome my parents not being able to do the things that they could do when other kids had more than me. I was a very small kid, but people who haven't physically met me, I'm 6'5", 270, right? But as a kid, I was a really, really small kid. I was really, really poor. And when I see and I hear about the conditions that everyone's in, you know, I didn't have my own room until I was 15 years old. In fact, I didn't know what a box spring was until I was 15. I just thought it was going to throw a mattress on top of mattresses. And our first cardboard, our first table was a cardboard box with a yellow drape over it. I want you to imagine the psychological issues that exist as a young kid without explaining it, how inferior you're going to feel comparative towards everybody else and what, and what they have. Okay, that, that, this is important for you guys to understand. When I went to college at, at 18, our lives changed a little bit. You know, the first thing I want to talk about is opportunity. My parents, unbeknownst to whatever the reasoning was, if you guys write opportunity down, this is very important to write this word down. My parents were working so hard that the reason we had a restaurant was because we were renting the restaurant out from a guy when we lived in Aspen. And although we had a restaurant, we lived in the hood. I mean the hood hood, right? And my parents had one guy named Pedro Zaragoza, one of the richest men in Mexico. His family's so rich, they're on the actual peso bill. He flew in, he did a private, he wanted to have a restaurant, he flew in a private jet. And what he wanted to do was buy my parents' recipe for teriyaki chicken. There was no Google internet at the time, thank God. And then when my parents like, you're crazy, you want to buy a teriyaki chicken recipe. And then a day later, he came in and he offered my parents an opportunity to move to Ciudad Juarez, which is right across the border from us here, and live in El Paso and work in Juarez. That's how I got here. So at 10 years old, coming from the hood and being broke, I get in a private jet and instantaneously, I knew there was something better. Think about that. We can't even afford baloney and we're flying on a private jet to get here. So of course my parents asked, what do you want to do? And I'm like, well, let's move. I didn't know where El Paso was. I had no idea what, it was, what was going on. I had no idea the things that were going to face. But opportunity happens. And when it happens, don't question the why understand the why people question the why because they're afraid they don't have self-belief in themselves so now they make excuses on why they can't do it and i know you know what i'm talking about because all of us have done that including myself second thing when i then moved forward and i became a, a you know a teenager and, and started moving forward again i was going to college i was the first in my family to go to college my parents worked their butts off we finally got a home at 16. I finally get to go to University of Arizona. Let me tell you guys something. I was told by every single person that I ever did when I did school, 
I was never going to make it in business. I wasn't going to pass all the, all the tests. That I was stupid. That I was never going to make a thing out of myself. And the shittiest part is I believed it. Because as a young man, as a young person, you're looking for mentorship and guidance from people that respect. Because people don't respect you because they think you're a waste of time because it doesn't help them out. Right? When that had happened and, and that had moved forward with it, I spent six years at the University of Arizona. I got in with a 1020 SAT score. For you guys from Texas, I couldn't even pass a pause test. And I kid you not, I went to a school that had 12 people. And when I got in there, my first class was 440 people. And I almost threw up. I was like, oh my God. And the craziest part is, think about my age at that time. I'm 18. I would not talk to people because I'm so self-conscious and so afraid to talk to people. The way I can talk to people now, I built it in my system. I wasn't taught this stuff. Because I was a very shy, insecure child, kid, a young man trying to find what's going on. So when you go in the education system, I say this all the time, I didn't, school didn't fail me. I fell school because I didn't, I didn't utilize my time. I wasn't efficient in trying to make things work. I pissed on the opportunity to get a degree. In fact, six years later, I still owe like $10,000 for school with no college degree. And if you're an Asian, you should have a PhD in six years, right? So now I'm culturally being ashamed. I, I, I was told I wasn't gonna be shit and I've proven that I'm not gonna be shit. And then I have my cousins getting masters and PhDs and my friends are getting jobs at Honeywell and making 80, 90 grand. And you know how big I felt? This big. And being insecure and not being able to tell anybody that, I was so lost and so afraid to share what I was going through that I basically just sat there and I cried every single day, praying for guidance and doing nothing about it. I want you guys to understand that. When I went back home, the reason I left because both my parents had a heart attack. That means when bad situations happen, you have to make the best of it. That's my point of the story. So they came home, I got one year left in school. My sister, being the Asian genius, she has skips a year, gets a scholarship. I'm there for six. I'm like, dude, I can't even lie at this point. I'm a 22 year old junior. I gotta, I gotta dip out. So I did what was best for me. I left my friends, my girlfriend at the time, everyone that I loved, and I thought my world was going to end. And I came back to El Paso as a failure with no friends. The crazy part about the story is, you wanna talk about why you wanna do things or why you don't, it's a matter if you want to or you don't want to. When I was in college, I couldn't work one day a week. And then I'm sitting here at my parents' business and I'm working a hundred to 120 hours a week. It was 168 hours a week, I was sitting three to four hours. So it wasn't that I couldn't do it, I chose not to do it. I couldn't hold the job for one day. So a lot of the young people that run this thing, they don't understand it. It's not about where you came from or what you're doing, it's about what you want to do and you stop making excuses for you not being able to do stuff. Because let's face it, no one told you not to watch Netflix, no one told you not to play games, no one told you not to do this and that. You do it on your own, you travel, you know how to party, do all that stuff. But it wasn't meaningful enough in my life to make the impact that I wanted. When that had happened, I remember sitting there at 20 through 25, and if you guys are younger than me, and, and I was driving a beat up Honda, my sister graduated college, uh, my cousins now have double PhDs. I mean, they're super intelligent human beings. And I could not even look at my friends because I felt like I was worthless. Think about a time in your life that you felt worthless. Be honest with yourself. Why did you feel worthless? Let me give you the super answer. It's because of your ego. So the first thing I teach in the course is ego is not your amigo. Sounds funny, but it's true. Every decision you make is based on ego, which then causes more problems. Think about what I'm saying. If you own a company and your competitor opens another store on the other side of town, what are you trying to do? Well, we're smarter than them. We can do it. We're going to do it. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's get it done. But you know that you don't have the infrastructure and ability to do so, but your ego made you do that. 
and then cause more stress and problems because this is the part where people say people buy dumb stuff to impress people that, that don't matter. That's an ego play. When you look at your car and you look at the things you have, and you're like, that guy has a Rolls. I got to up my game to compete with the Joneses. That's an ego play. When you're trying to wear an $800 Gucci belt and $500 J's and you can't even afford electricity, that's an ego play. So I want you guys to think, how many times in your life are you making bad decisions because of your ego? And the first thing you have to do to let things go is to let go of your ego because your ego is the reason that you have so much pain and suffering. You're causing your own pain and suffering. Think about what I'm saying. Really think about it. How many times did something you actually didn't want to do, but you did it because your ego told you to do so? Think about that. I'm gonna give you guys one second to think about that. Can I get a, the tie stuff in there? Right? Now, when I was 23 to 25, the one thing I knew and I learned was my niche. What's gonna make me different from every single person? Before I get into how to make a ton of money and how to become a multimillionaire and y'all don't have a book for you to buy, I don't have a course for you to sign up, I am as real as I possibly can be. Matt's filming me for a while. Alexis is one of my tenants. Jordan CJ, I met to speak in a podcast. My nephew is, 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 is on. But I want to tell you guys something. It's because I'm real with people. And I will tell you this. It sucks. It fucking sucks to be this way. It's hard. It's not fun. But the quicker you let go of your ego, the easier your life will be. Now, ego is very different from being a competitor and competing and being focused. Being focused, competing, being competitor is because you want to win. Ego is you're doing more than you need to do. So you see the guys in baseball, they're taking steroids because their egos, because the 72 home runs not enough, I have to do eight, right? You see the athletes, they should have retired in year 13, but you're playing year 14 and 15 like Brett Favre did, he should have quit, but his ego wouldn't allow him to do so. It messed up his legacy. Ego, is what kills. And I'm going to beat that into your guys' brain because from now on, when you make a decision, I want you to think about one thing. Before you make that decision, am I making decision because of my ego or I'm making decision if it's good? Any decision I ever make, I think about the ego side of it before I make that decision. That's how I work. It's that simple. And if I think I don't have the time or the ability to structure, like some of you guys already know, I'm sorry, I can't do it because I'm trying to earn the respect of the people as opposed to play for my own ego. Can everyone relate to that? Okay. The next thing I want to talk about, when I found my niche, this is very important, to find your niche is the one thing that's going to separate you from every single person. This is a in general topic. I will go into more detail about it, but because of the sake of time, I just want to tell you this. My niche is I speak five languages. My niche is I have a very high EQ, right? If I took the IQ test, I'm borderline intelligent. So that's why I think about tech. They're, they're, they're horseshit, okay? Doesn't mean that they don't matter. It just means that just because someone tells you you're not smart, doesn't mean you're not smart. Just because someone says you're not worthy, doesn't mean you're not worthy. Just because you had a crappy environment with your dad, doesn't mean that you're damaged. Just because you didn't have any money growing up, doesn't mean you have to follow the wrong path. You can still do the right thing and teach the next generation. That's what this is all about. And this is why my circles are so small. This is why I'm very, very particular who I deal with because I don't care. You don't want to deal with me, great. You want to deal with me, fine, right? When I was 25 years old, I remember saying, I speak five languages and I'm like, scribble down. I'm trying to figure it out. I don't have a college degree. And fate happened. Fate happened because my parents who had a restaurant working there after three years of not having a degree, had a gentleman named Fosse Gallardo, rest his soul. He was the founding partner of Deloitte and him as the founding partner of Deloitte, this gentleman wanted to work with me because I could speak languages. And I had to figure out the, the, the added value, which is why I speak five languages. So instead of you having to hire Pablo and Chang and, and Steve, you have me who can speak all the languages and go from there. Value 
adding? What is your worth? What can I give you? Not what you can give me. And where everyone screws up is they'll hit me up like, hey, can you help me out? I'm like, sure. And then they'll tell me what I can give them. I'm like, dude, I get 100 of these a day. What is your added value to me? I'll help you out. But you have to add value to people. You just can't just keep asking. So I want you guys to understand that. And my added value was I identified that my niche is going to be different. Now think about what I'm trying to tell you. If you're going to school right now, if you graduate college or whatever you're trying to do, a university, let's face it, if someone went to Harvard, you take the last person from Harvard and the first place person from community college. Fair or not fair? It's true, right? The second thing is when it comes to the textbooks, they're the same type of books taught by the same type of people for 10 years. And so now you're competing with everyone who learned from the same teacher and everything else. So what is making you different? And it's not, I work harder than you. That's one factor. But what is really gonna identify you? If you're in business, if you're in your personal space, let me tell you something. Personal business, it's the same habits. So if you have an ego in business, you're having an ego at home. And if you don't know what your niche is in, at, at home, you have to know what your niche is in business. If you know what's gonna separate yourself from everyone else, that is a major problem. And when I realized that I could speak those multiple languages, that really helped me out because I was doing something else. When I talk about opportunity the second time, the very first time they asked me to work at Deloitte, I did not know what Deloitte was. In fact, when I got the job, my friends were like, how'd you get this job? Let me see your business card. Haters. They couldn't understand how a kid who didn't graduate could go to, to work at Deloitte. And here's the craziest part. They're like, hey, can you run a Chinese group? First off, I had never been to China. It's not from Taiwan. But I was like, sure, I'll take the job. I'll do it. I'll make it work. I'll take this $50,000 a year. And what do you think the first thing I did when I got that job was? I pissed away all my money by trying to be a cool guy, by buying bottles and hanging out with models and drinking and buying a brand new car and living beyond my means because it goes back to the ego factor. So I'm from Deloitte, I made it. I didn't have to sit there and graduate. Ha ha ha, take that my friends. That's the difference between doing it the right way and pissing people off to get more haters. That's what happened. You know what happened after that? I worked there for six months. I love the story. When I worked there for six months, I was educating, I was asking for, for training sessions. And you would think that they would train someone. If you're a 46 billion dollar company, you're gonna train the newest guy there. What I didn't realize was they weren't training me. I had to know. And so what ended up happening was I got fired. And that's 60, 70 thousand dollars. I became the biggest joke in the world. I was there for six months, no degree, trying to be a show off, telling about how cool I was at 25 years old because that was my insecurities as a person. Uh, David, you're frozen. I think I'm frozen. All right, we're not frozen anymore. All right, back to what we're doing. Everyone's taking up my internet speed. But, but what happened was when I was alone, I was trying to figure this out. I was too proud to ask for help. Does that sound like something that everyone here does? I was too ashamed. But what happened to my shame? It made it worse. It made it much more worse. So I'm crying and I'm upset and I'm frustrated and I'm praying and I'm praying and I'm like, oh, I don't want to do this. And I'll be honest, thoughts of ending myself happen. I was as low as I could possibly be because at 25 years old, I, they were right. I wasn't going to be shit. And I proved them right. One day, I wake up and I'm like, dude, screw this. I'm going to make this work. And you know what I did? I went back and I did a thing called add value. Hey, add value is literally the most important thing to do. Because what add value does is it literally... I made a value add proposition. I said, listen, if you let me come back here and I knew my niche, my niche was Asian business, that I speak the language, and let me deal with just the Asian clients and let me sell every service and function. All you do is have to pay me 
$2,000 a month and I will hit a goal of $15,000 value add. They have to make at least 40%. I took a 60% pay cut to go work back at Deloitte. How many of you would have taken a 60% pay cut to prove that you can do it? In this world that I've met, I've met four people that, that would have ever done that. I had to check my own ego and sit there and say I could do it. And here's the crazy part. The whole world's knowledge is in the palm of your phone and you're too busy doing Instagram and doing silly things. And I'm a big Instagram guy, but if you want to learn and educate yourself, this is my school of education, my cell phone. So there's no excuse for you not to know anything so that you want to or you don't want to. So guess what I did as a college dropout who had to go back to Deloitte with my face between my cell. I learned everything. I grew up about China. I grew up about news. I grew up about joint ventures, accounting, finance, taxes. I took the initiative, and that's when I realized either you want to do it or you don't, but you're going to make a million excuses on why you shouldn't do it. And if you start doing that, then you should absolutely do it because you're convincing yourself not to do it, right? No one teaches you what time the movies are at. No one teaches you how to look up what's going to be on Netflix. No one teaches you how to plan for a trip. But you can't teach yourself, and you tell yourself to do that, how to plan a business, how to learn, how to educate, how to self-improve. You don't want to. And that's the first thing about ego is you don't, want to be where you are because you don't want to be where you are you want to use the excuses to stop yourself so if you're not an immigrant who's a college dropout who had no relationship with his dad who was homeless who was uneducated like myself then you had a lot better than i did and i'm not saying that you had it worse or better i'm just saying don't use the excuses to restrict yourself because the only person you're hurting is you and here's the worst part nobody gives a shit if you fail or if you don't fail they don't care Oh, I'm so sorry. My bad, Alexis. I move on my life. That's how life works. You have to hold yourself responsible. You have to sit and take the initiative. You have to stop making excuses. You have to want to educate yourself and do the type of education that you so rightfully deserve. Because the reality is, you deserve it. Just look it up. That's what matters. There's no excuses. So much so, how I know this. I'll be teaching at three universities in the upcoming year as a college dropout. Think about what I just said. When I applied for my master's program, after I made the Deloitte, when I went to Deloitte, they're like, hey, where's your degree? And I was like, what degree? I told you guys that. You have to go get a degree. You know what I did? Forget my bachelor's. I started calling all the master's programs. Say, I'm a partner at Deloitte. I don't have a degree. Can, you, can I work for you? They're like, well, we never heard the situation. We'll bring you in. I got a partial scholarship. The road and the path is whatever you want it to be. The restriction is yourself, and you have to unwind that stuff because you are devaluing yourself because everyone else tells you so, and your ego is allowing them to tell you so. Now do you understand why ego is such a big freaking deal and why you have to check it? That's the reality. Let me go to part two. You have 15 minutes left for my next session. Perspective. Right now, it's tough. You might not be where you want to be mentally. You might, might want to be where you are physically. You may not want to be where you are emotionally. Hell, your sister, your brother, your best friend, your org, your team, your podcast, your, your uncle, whatever it is. Let me tell you something. We are still, if you're on this call with me, you are richer than 99% of the world. You know, I know this because I was one of the, I was one of the 99%. I was homeless. If you're richer, you're more blessed. All of you are sitting at a home. All of you are on the internet. All of you have time at five or five o'clock mountain time to be on this call. Why are you not being grateful for what you have? How can you expect more if you aren't grateful for what you have, if you had a child who wasn't grateful for what they had, would you give them more? You know the answer is no, right? Whatever you believe in, I'm not talking about religion, if you're not grateful for what you have, how can you expect more? 
You wouldn't do it. Why would you say they want to do it to you? So one thing I have to talk about is perspective. Here's what I want everyone to do. And if you, again, if you sign on late, join the davidchenpatton.com. Make sure you sign back up. If you don't get a session call, five o'clock next week, go ahead and DM me or DM Patanomics. We'll make sure you get it. That's your responsibility, not ours. And I, next week's session, I'll go from there. But let me tell you what it is. On that list, we use a power perspective. What I want everyone to do is just think about what I'm saying. I promise me you'll do this for the next seven days. I will promise you it will change your life. I can promise you this. This changed my life. Write down everything you're grateful for and call it the power of perspective. So, Christian, you can say, I am grateful for breathing. Jordan, I am grateful for seeing. Alexis, I am grateful for, for, for being around. John, I am grateful for, for, for eating. Whatever it is, write down every little thing you're grateful for. Your mom, your dad, your uncle, your cousin, your, whatever makes you happy. Down to the most simplest thing that we take for granted. Like right now, we can't walk around COVID, right? We can't walk around. We can't go to the movies. We can't see our friends. I can't travel. We have to wear masks. We took for granted the most simplest thing in life, which is the function. And what happens is in our lives, we're so caught up with the Joneses and our egos that we're so ungrateful for what we have. And if you look at this list, every morning and every night, or when you're in a bad mood, I can promise you it's not as bad as you think it is. Because you, if, if I remember this because one day my mom's yelling at me and I'm super upset. I'm like, oh gosh, she's so annoying. And then I call my friend and he's like, dude, my mom just died. Grateful. I was like, man, I had my mom nag at me all day long with her disappear. We are all dealt with different cards. Every single one of us. Christian's cards are different from CJ's, which is different from John's, which is different from Alexis, which is different from Victoria's, which is different from Nick's. We're all from different points of view. We're all different parts of the world. But if I can teach you guys anything, is the first thing is check your ego. Secondly, being grateful for what you have. And every single day, write down anything good that happened. Stop focusing on the negative stuff. Write the good stuff. It will change your mindset. Write the good stuff, the stuff that you, you're grateful for. And look at the list every single day and night. And by the end of the week, by next week, if you guys are still on this thing, if I've added any real value to you, I promise you, the 115 people I've already done this with will tell you their lives completely change because they're grateful. And when you're grateful, your ego starts to disappear. You, start focus, you stop focusing on what you don't have, you start focusing on what you do have. And that's the big difference. You know I did private equity? You know where I learned about private equity? When I was in the cannabis space, the esports space, China, blockchain, crypto. Right there. That's how I learned it. So if I can learn it, y'all obviously have the people doing it. Learn it. Stop making excuses. The quicker you do that, the quicker you liberate yourself from your ego, the quicker you're grateful for things, the more happier you are. And this is how I'm going to tell you guys this. There is a re reason that celebrities blow their brains out. There is a reason that billionaires blow their brains out. There is a reason that when they die, they're by themselves. Because they're unhappy with themselves. I can't do anything about certain things that are just inevitable. If you could, if everything, if you had any control, the one thing I'm gonna teach you is what has COVID taught us? We have no control. I don't care how superior you are, how much money you have, who you think you are, you have no control. If you had control, we'd all be billionaires, we'd all be celebrities, everyone would be healthy, and every family would be rich and you have nothing to worry about. You have no control of the environment. You only have control of yourself and your emotions and what you, what you shoot out and what you can put in. It's the truth. Because if, if you had control, you wouldn't even need to be on this call. Control is the most false sense of reality. Control is based on ego. And when you can't control control, it's because your ego is so big that you're not thinking perspective well. I can't do anything about it. I'm going to keep moving forward with it. That's the reality of it. So don't sit there and buy someone's $50,000 program. The reality is, just Google what I've done. I've been on Forbes 18 times the last 15 months. 
That's not to say how great I am. This is a college dropout who's an immigrant, who was homeless, who's from El Paso, Texas, and still chooses to live here because there are no restrictions besides the ones that you want to put on yourself. And that, my friends, is lesson one. I will give you a book. I promise you, if you read this book, if you can't invest $7.95, you're in the wrong place. Go somewhere else next week. It is called The Magic Kingdom by Tom H. Let's put Tom H. on top of that. The Magic Kingdom. I hate reading. I absolutely hate reading. There's one thing that I absolutely, absolutely hate. Oh, one second. Can you hear now, Nick? Hey, yeah, it's all good. Thank you. Cool. I'm going to put you back on mute, okay? Um, the Magic Kingdom is literally a book that changed my life, and I hate reading, right? When you read this book by Tom, you know, what's the name of the book? And what's the last, the, the last name? I have it in my office. I'll tell you guys in a second. But anyways, there's only one by Tom. It's called The Magic Kingdom, right? If you read this book, it is the most easiest read. But when you read it, I want you to think about it. This is written on why Disney is Disney. Disney knows ESPN. Disney is one of the biggest companies in the world. Talk, Tom Canelli with the speed. And it tells you what they do and the seven and eight steps. And you as a leader in life and you as a leader in business, you have to read this book. I'll give you the first example why this is important. When they ask you who your competition is, Christian, or Jordan, or Victoria, who your competition is in business, you know what your answer is? Everybody's your competition because your competitor can spend their money anywhere they want. Lesson one. And when I saw that, I was like, oh, when I first read it, I was like, my competition, well, in accounting, this is my competition, and the restaurants is my competition, the bars is my competition. And I realized everyone's my competition because you, you as a consumer can spend money anywhere you want. Same thing for life. When you're your partner, your friends, your family, who's your competition? Everyone's your competition. This book is so important. It's so pivotal for the first lesson that if you read this book, I will promise you by lesson eight, nine, 10, that everyone else that stuck with it is like, holy cow, I can't believe this makes sense. And this is why it works. Right? Well, one last thing I want to say to everyone before I get to like five, 10 minutes of questions is this. 100%. Some of you have heard of this. I'm going to say it again. You have survived 100% of your worst days. When you thought your life was over, when your heart was broken, if you lost the business, when you lost a loved, a loved one, when you didn't do what you wanted to do, you thought your world was going to end. Every single person on this call is a survivor. Give yourself some props. You survive every time you couldn't. This is why you'll survive anything because your mindset will change because you survived 100% of your worst day. Now, here's what I'm gonna ask you guys to do. What I'm gonna ask you to do is take a photo of the screen if you want to, but if you were like to be great tag me tag panonomics put on your story that's all i'm asking you to do i'm not charging all i need you to do that so we can spread the message and continue to help people grow and evolve and next week we'll have more cool things and if you lost anything you came late you weren't sure you can always dm me but jump on that facebook it's called david chen panda you'll be added on to it follow the session follow what's going on you know educate yourself and grow and believe so Right now, about 10 minutes. Are there any questions that you guys want to ask? Can you tell, can you tell, the, next, can you tell the next session? Anybody? Uh, Jordan, go ahead. I'll um, uh, okay, well, I guess you know, I'm, I feel I'm a little bit on the spot here, but um, you know what? You know, you, what made you, you know, get into real estate? That's, that's probably a good question of mine. Well, the first answer is this. 
when you go online, you listen to all these ads about how everyone can make a ton of money, millions of dollars because of real estate. I lost millions of dollars because I didn't know how to do real estate. But the one business that I did do, my current business is, I will tell you, I bought it at two, three, it's worth about 6.6 .6 million. Three, four years later. And every single time someone told me it wasn't gonna work, I had to swallow my pride and keep moving forward with it. It's not about the real estate, it's not about other people's money, it's not about flips, it's not how it works. I own a commercial lending platform that's with 3,000 people, right? 3,000 banks. I've done real estate, I wrote real estate in other companies. I, you know, I'm a lead investor at nyce.co with Martin Brawhaus of FC Barcelona as my partners. Why well, I want a real estate? Because in my investment strategy, I have a short term, I have a mid term, and I have a long term. And those strategies help me with my finances of what I'm going to do and how I'm going to do it. So I'm trying to make immediate cash flow or middle cash flow, which is a little bit more advanced in our program and long term. Then I'm actually watching out for anything that's happening through the short period of times and through the markets and through the economy. So I did do real estate. I still do real estate. I mean, I have a group of real estate with multi million dollar properties but it's from multi-million dollar failures. That's what it came from. Thank you. No problem. Hello? Next. Nick? Hey. Hey, What's so up, man? Um, I was just like wondering, right? So like I have a few like business ventures that I'm working on. And uh, for example, like I have like an online kind of like business uh, regarding like uh, videography, photography, media, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like I've been really focusing on networking lately, but I was like wondering in like in, from your perspective or in your opinion, if I hit like a kind of stagnant point where I'm not really seeing much progress or I'm not really seeing any like increase of opportunities, I don't know how, 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 how to word it, but what would you recommend I do if I'm feeling like I'm stuck or stagnant at a point? First things first, is you never know who you're impacting. If you didn't reach out to me on social media, I'm gonna reach out to you to come here. First thing, mm -hmm. keep that in mind. Second thing is, that it's very great to keep the metrics and saying I have to grow, but it's more important to keep pushing out content. Let me give you, let me give you an example. I have been stagnant at 83 to 90,000 followers for almost seven months now. I have. And what I really want to do is drop two, three thousand dollars, press promo, and get millions of followers because I know that I could do it. That's an ego play. That's my ego trying to compete with the guys that I know don't hold bearing to me. You never know who you're going to impact, and let me tell you why I say that. Flex Lewis, if you Google him, is a seven-time Mr. Olympia. He's my business partner now. I was speaking on IG Live where I met I met some of you guys, and he messages me. He follows me. I'm like, oh, Flex Lewis, 2 million followers, big dude, you know, sometime Mr. Olympia. A month later, he sends me a message. He goes, hey, man, you're so inspirational and motivational to me. I just had to follow you. Seven-time Mr. Olympia is following some dude from El Paso. You don't know where your impact is. Don't sell yourself short, man. Just keep pushing out the content. You don't know who's watching. I watch you. You don't know I'm watching you, but I do. And I know what you're doing. That's the impact. In fact, half these people I've met, Matt in particular, I met online. Don't let that be the case. Keep growing, keep pushing our content. You can go back and forth. I have different content all the time, but don't get in the trap of, of, of ego. I'm not saying that's your, that's your issue, but make sure that's not the issue. You don't know who you're impacting. Just keep doing it, man. It's gonna eventually happen and just go from there. Right. Well, I really appreciate that. I'm definitely going to like focus more on content and just uh, putting out stuff for people to see, because I, I definitely do agree. I have had uh, a few people that like reach out to me that like have been like uh, a goal of mine. And so, yeah, I definitely will stick to uh, producing more con content and yeah, definitely like the ego thing. I definitely agree with. I don't know if you saw, but I reposted uh, your post on my story because I think that yeah, ego is definitely a creativity killer and it's just negative in every aspect in my opinion. But yeah, thanks, thanks again. No problem, my man. Um, any, I mean, let's keep, I, I really like to have everyone ask one question so I get to your guys' questions. Um, I can go down the list. If you don't have a question, you can say, I don't, I don't, but I want to give one free time. So I'm going to go down my list of the participants that I have. Next person is, is, is Alexis. Alexis, go ahead and tell me um, 
what you're looking at as far do you have any questions yeah um do you ever feel overwhelmed and if you do what do you do about it i feel overwhelmed every single day of my life doesn't look like that on social media does it <laughs> no doesn't look like that on forbes doesn't look like that on entrepreneur doesn't look like that on inc like anyone that tells you any differently they're full of shit i feel overwhelmed every day but here's the here's here's the reality of it i can be upset and cry about it but the energy I spend there if I took that energy to actually do my job and do what I had to do I'd be fine being overwhelmed and feeling like you're not gonna do it right like dude out of 30 days a month I have four days I'm like dude I don't know if I, if I can do this anymore and I, I have Meltzer and Gary calling and flex following me and all these people but I'm honest with people I don't lie about this stuff we all deal with this we're human beings it's normal <sighs> take a deep breath Look at your power perspective list, be grateful, and know that you survived much of your worst days. And that's why I said what I said today, because that's the first thing that's killing everybody. When you do that, you're gonna be okay. Spend more time doing, less time worrying, because let's face it, how many times have you worried about something and it just doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't even happen, right? That's how I do it, one day at a time, guys. All right, thank you. Nephew, you have a question? What do you think of Forex? About what? Forex. Forex, Forex? exchange. Yeah, Forex exchange. Look, look nephew, I, I love you to death, but I'm gonna tell you what it is. If there was a quick way to make money, I would have figured it out before you would have, and so would have Mark Cuban and, 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 and Warren Buffett. You know why I don't sell books and anything else? even though I could, because I'd be lying to you guys on how I'm doing it. If I don't tell you the struggles, you can't believe me. How many people will tell you the struggles and be this vulnerable? If you want to do it, you can, but do it because you're comfortable trading with your ability to do so, small amounts of money. There are no big things. If you don't understand what you're doing, that is no different than gambling and putting $100. You're way too young to gamble. Don't tell your dad I said this. And, and put it on the, on, on, on the tables, it's the same thing. You have to understand, you're very young. It takes time. And the older I get, the, the more I realize it's just gonna take more time for me to be able to do that and move forward and go from there. Christian, do you have a question, my friend? Uh, yeah. Um, you said that you lost a lot of money when you first got into real estate because you didn't know how to properly do it. Um, how old were you and what other income did you have at the time? So I was, a, I do a thing called a corporate entrepreneur. I always had a job while being an entrepreneur, 168 hours a week. You work 40, 40 hours a week. You sleep seven hours a day. You travel two hours. If you do the math, I have this chart. You still have 40 hours a week to do whatever you want to do. And most people, People get caught up because they're doing this and they're doing that. Like, I don't have any time. That's, 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 that's a crock of it. Number two, when you're doing real estate, it's not just buying and selling. It's your ability to understand what a contractor does. Labor laws. The first time I bought a home, I was like, oh, it's worth $120,000. I'm getting it for 90. With closing costs and realtor fees, it was $120,000. I didn't make any money. If I understood the market in El Paso was only increased 8% a year, man, I could put that in anything and make that in a month. I didn't really understand it because I was too busy listening to these get quick rich schemes that you hear all the time. Come on, man. If anyone could do that, I would have already done that stuff by now. So it's really understanding the knowledge, understand that when you do a multi-million dollar project like I've done in the heart of El Paso, even though it's a great project, nobody wanted to fund it because it was El Paso. That's really an issue. So understanding the whole thing before you do it and being honest with yourself, that's what I did. That's how I started going from there. And, and that's what was different because I truly had to understand it. In order to do it. That's why in eSports, I do everything because now that's how I do everything. I have to understand it all, so I also won't do it. Uh, Matt, do you have a question? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, at what, so you're talking to people that are actually listening to you about ego and how they could change themselves and make themselves better. But what happens when I 
what what should I do in a situation where I am trying to tell someone that they have an ego and they feel like they don't have an ego and I give them the same advice you give me and they still don't listen to me. How do I approach that? Do I let them fail? Because just to let them see what I'm trying to say or do I, how do I approach that situation? Well, it depends on who it is. If you're talking about a team member. He's a, he's my best, one of my best Call of Duty players. Drop him. Just him. Drop him. Why would you keep him? That's your ego. You're doing what's best. You're telling them that this is a problem. They don't want to listen. If they don't listen now, they're never going to listen. Why deal with it? Why? You have more. There's billions of people in the world. Why? I feel like as part of me is attached to helping a person because like you're helping me in terms of understanding shit. I feel like I can help them Matt, understand I'm, shit. Matt, I'm helping you because you listen and you understand. I have yeah. NFL players that listen to me, NBA players, multimillionaires, Flex Lewis. I have friends that don't listen to me. I drop them. Not because I'm trying to be a jerk. We don't have to talk about this stuff. We'll just talk about whatever you want to talk about. We can watch the game. Sure. True. But if it's my business and my life and you don't want to listen to me, first tell me why you don't want to listen to me. Let me understand the reasoning. Let me understand where your perspective, maybe my perspective is different from your perspective. That matters. But if they're being like that, what do you think is going to happen when they get bigger? Their ego gets bigger, right? Yeah, it turns into a piece of shit. And, and who invested all that time and money? You did. My dumb ass. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but it, it just is what it is. You're right. CJ, you have a question? Thank you. Uh, Good ball, man. Yeah, it's going to be worded weirdly because I don't really know how to ask this, but like I'm trying to get in contact with a foundation and I'm trying to get like a job created in all the hospitals to help people with IBD. What I'm really trying to do is get an IBD rep at every hospital, but like the people I'm trying to talk to, like my doctor, I've told him to like contact that foundation. I try to contact the foundation. I'm not getting anywhere. It's been like a few months already. How would I like, tr like get the best results and who would I talk to for that? Just keep doing it. Just keep asking, just keep pushing emails. Matt, my man, I, I say that because you think that at a certain point you deserve to have an answer. That's an ego play. Do you know how many banks that had to go? You know how many? Do you know how many banks I had to go to to get the funding for this project? Seventy six go f off. Seventy six of begging. Seventy six. Seventy six to make it a, a six million dollar project. Got to keep going. If it means that much to you, you're going to keep doing it, no matter what anyone says. All right. That's Thank you. Simple, going from there. Last person is that Victoria. Do you have a question? Go ahead. Uh, I do not have a question, but I just want to thank you for getting on here and allowing us to get on. I also loved everyone else's questions, and I really took value from what it is that you had to say and how you answered everyone's questions, too. I took note of that. So I really appreciate that, and thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Nick, you have the coolest backgrounds. They keep changing. I love them. I have to show me how to do that. Uh, Victoria, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Promise me, you guys will at least read the book. If you don't read this, at least promise me you'll do the list. And the last thing is, I can't force you to do anything. You don't need motivation, you need action. That's it. And go from there. But um, I'm late for my other session. Same time next week. If you can't show up, please give me the courtesy to let me know you can't show up. Just a mutual sign of respect, and we'll go from there. All right, guys. Thank you. We'll talk to you guys soon. Thank, Thank you so much, man. Take care.